Welcome. Uh, we are very happy to have you here and thank you so much for supporting our psychology department and the Psi Beta Club. Uh, we're going to talk about culture tonight and I'm hoping that you can walk away with some useful information and be able to understand culture at a little bit different uh, level and maybe kind of think about culture uh, from your own perspective as well. So I am uh, going to just kind of introduce culture uh, to say the least. <laughs> oh, but first I need to turn this on, right? Yeah, there we go. So. One of the most difficult questions that I find students um, have an to answer to is what is culture? What is their culture? As an American, uh, we often kind of think of culture as other people, other countries, other uh, areas, other ethnicities. We think of other groups. We often don't consider culture for ourselves. And, and that is a difficult question for people to answer when they are looking from their own perspective. And so if you think about culture, it, it's everything. It, it's your values, it's your beliefs, it can be your nationality, race, all these different things. And uh, culminated, added up, it makes culture, it makes our culture. So if you think about it, um, and we can piece together all these little identities and, and, and kind of add up uh, who we are. Uh, can anyone think of an identity uh, that they feel is important to their culture? Yeah. Oh, it's a, um, uh, religion. Religion, absolutely. So education. Education. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Those are very influential. Any others? Oh, come on. I know someone's got something. Yeah. Food. What's that? Food. food. Actually, believe it or not, food is a big part of our culture, right? As Americans, what do we like to eat? <coughs> Everything. <laughs> <laughs> Macaroni and cheese. For those of my students, they've been hearing me yap on all week about macaroni and cheese. I've been obsessed with it lately because uh, Thanksgiving's coming, so it's my one excuse to eat it. Um, <laughs> Food, right? Food, it can define who we are. So all these things, when we add them together, they define exactly what we consider our culture. So let's think about our behaviors and culture and some of the things that um, we do uh, uh, to express our culture. So traditions are one of them. So culture is often passed on from one generation to the next. And so as an American, some of our traditions are things like Thanksgiving next week, right? Fourth uh, of July celebration. We have uh, different kinds of events throughout the year. Some of us celebrate Christmas, some of us don't. And that's the thing that makes us very unique is because when I think of Thanksgiving, I have a specific picture in my mind of what Thanksgiving is. Is there anyone here that doesn't have a turkey on Thanksgiving? Everyone has turkey? Yeah? What do you have? I work. What is it? I work. You work every Thanksgiving. Aw, someone needs to bring you some turkey. <laughs> anyone else? Anything? Yeah. Eat pork. Pork? Yeah. S yeah. Uh, one time I went to my friend's Thanksgiving and duck yeah so Thanksgiving looks different but often the majority of Americans share Thanksgiving in some way shape or form right and, and so this is something that we share it's a tradition it's been passed on from generation to generation how many of you have a, a family recipe specific for Thanksgiving that is used every year right yeah a lot of you right I'm seeing some hands. The, these are parts of our culture, and these are going to influence us greatly. So let's look at how we learn our culture. So for those of you who have taken psychology classes, these might be kind of some uh, flashbacks from those classes. But one way that we learn culture is through vicarious learning or observational learning. We learn things by watching other people. 
seen what other people do. This starts at a really, really young age, a very young age. So uh, there are things that we do that nobody had to tell us what to do. No one had to specifically say, oh, this is what we do in our culture. They're just things that we do. And that's because we've observed other people that are part of our group, and we've learned that vicariously through watching them. And, and this is, it, it starts from the time our eyes can actually focus, basically, our ability to uh, watch and observe others. Another one that I find is an important way of learning is through operant conditioning. So we learn things by uh, being reinforced or punished. Now, when I, I say punished, it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, if you don't do what uh, is normal for culture, you're going to go to prison. Oh, that's a law. Um, <laughs> that's a law. Uh, but punishment can be something as simple as a look. Does so anybody um, have a mother or, or someone in their family that when you did something bad or did something that they didn't approve of, yes. they gave the look? <laughs> Anyone get that? Yes. Yeah. Didn't even have to say anything, right? Didn't even have to say one word and the look was enough. The look was just enough for you to be going like, well, I'm not doing that again. That is not happening. That, that is punishment, believe it or not. It's, it, it's something that will discourage you from ever performing that behavior ever again. It, so it could be something as simple as that. On the other hand, we get reinforcement, uh, which will increase those behaviors, increase the likelihood of those occurring again. It could be anything from a smile, or a hug, or a pat on the back, or uh, you know, a reward, candy, right? It can be rewarding, or macaroni and cheese, right? <laughs> I'm gonna see how many times I can slip that into the lecture tonight. <laughs> we'll just see. But this, these are ways that we learn our culture. We learn what we're supposed to do appropriately and how we're supposed to uh, behave in appropriate ways. And it's different depending upon which culture you're in. So let's uh, kind of think about this in, in a, a, a different sense. There's something called co-sleeping. Has anyone ever heard of co-sleeping? Yeah. So um, having an infant or a child sleep in the same bed with the parents or even in the same room. And so this is culturally influenced. What age do you think it is the oldest that a child should sleep with their parent? What do you think? Eight? Okay. What else? Three. Okay. Any others? What do you think? Six months? Anyone think six months? Anyone think it's appropriate or inappropriate for an infant to sleep with a parent? Yes? Yeah? That, that's common to, to feel that it's inappropriate. This is culturally influenced, very culturally influenced of whether or not we have uh, an infant or a child sleep with us. And so I, I pulled up some stats on this, and I think this is pretty interesting. Um, you can see the percentages. And this is co-sleeping um, anywhere from 6 to 48 months. 48 months, you know, that's a, a two-year-old. That's a two-year-old. So uh, in China, about 79% of the population uh, uh, adheres to co-sleeping. This is the normal. Um, Japanese, 59%. Believe it or not, here in the US, our African Americans uh, have co-sleeping in 59% of their population. If you drop down to the very bottom, Caucasian Americans, much less, right? 19%. But we're Americans. Why does that differ? Why would that differ? Because it's culture, right? It's culture. As uh, many African Americans tend to be what we call more collectivistic. They're, they're a shared community. 
their behaviors, their needs, their focus is for the, the larger group. Whereas uh, Caucasian Americans tend to be more on the individualistic side, the needs of themselves. So this is influential. If you look at the list, the higher collectivistic countries tend to have higher rates of co-sleeping. And the lower uh, collectivistic or the more individualistic uh, cultures tend to have less co-sleeping. And, and this is uh, culturally influenced behaviors. Typically our uh, westernized cultures, uh, infants are very kind of coddled and watched at all times and, and their play is very organized, it's very scripted, um, safety is always of a concern, right? Uh, you look at some of the other cultures and they were playing with nature, right? That's really was their toy, nature exploring. So it's a different way of growing up. It's, it starts very young. These different ideas and the lens that we see the world from starts then, starts back at that point in our life. And so when you interact with people, you might want to start considering, oh, maybe their lens is a little bit different than mine because of things that they've experienced from that point in their life. So let's, let's look at some other things that influence our culture. So some of this is, is more than likely refresher, but it's important when we're talking about culture. Our social and cultural norms. These are behaviors that are expected of us based upon the larger group. Now, they're often not always outwardly stated to us. They're unwritten. They're just expected. Uh, we do things based upon uh, expectations that others have of us, our group, the larger group. And so much of what we do as far as our culture is concerned is based off of these cultural norms. And we're going to look at this a little bit deeper as far as the cultural norms. So some of the things uh, that we do, we do basically to conform to change our behavior or adopt the behavior of the group, the larger group. And this is conformity. We conform to what others are doing for many reasons. Sometimes we conform to our group that we belong to because that's cultural norm or social norm. Sometimes we conform just so we don't stand out and look like big dummies, right? We just want to fit in to some extent. So let's think about conformity and social norms. What, what kind of things are American? Anybody have any ideas? What kind of things seem American? Cheeseburgers. cheeseburgers. Yes, eating cheeseburgers. Yes. Having your own car. Having your own car, right? Having transportation. Not if you're my kids, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, what else? This seems American. What kind of behaviors are American? Morning coffee. Morning coffee, definitely. Yeah. So as Americans, we like our personal space, right? But there is a specific amount that we like, actually. For strangers, people that uh, we do not know at all, it's usually about four feet. But for people that we know, like our friends, it's actually an arm's length. Does that seem about right? I was way closer than that, right? It was even a little uncomfortable for me, uh, just a little bit. Because we like our personal space. These are important to Americans. So when I watched you guys walk in, uh, what, did, what do you think I saw? I was over here meandering around watching, yeah. People being spaced out between seats. Yeah, I can see it even now. People spacing out in between seats. We do the same thing at movie theaters, right? We don't want to sit too close to someone. We don't know them. They could be up to shenanigans, right? <laughs> we don't know them. We, we don't. I just like the word shenanigans. <laughs> and macaroni and cheese. <laughs> so we like our personal space. It's not always like that everywhere. There are many countries that do not care about their personal space. 
there, it's not a big deal. So when someone from somewhere else gets up close to us, it might not be because they're a weirdo. It might just be that they are from a different culture, and that is the norm. We also like to be on time as Americans. Well, somewhat, right? It depends on the situation. But doctor's offices, right? Doctor's appointments, we need to be on time. What about job interviews? Absolutely, be on time. What about uh, going home to dinner for parents or for family members? It, meh, is it a little bit more flexible? <laughs> well, there is a time and place for being fashionably late. There absolutely is. Probably not at a job interview, though. I'm just discouraging that right now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm just going to discourage that. And there are occasions that being late is acceptable. Hint, hint. <laughs> I'm just kidding. As people walk in. <laughs> Got to pick on the people that come in, right? No, uh, there are times, but we do, we are timely. We're timely people. Uh, very timely. Not everywhere are we this timely. So let's think about Argentina. And, and I thought I'd get like the opposite end of the spectrum here. Uh, in Argentina, their people typically roll in 30 to 45 minutes late. So it's automatic. They're just late. If you go to, if you're invited to a dinner, uh, they'll say, oh, dinner's at 8 o'clock. If you show up at 8 o'clock here, I'm American, I'm punctual, I show up at 8 o'clock, and that host is going to be irritated. <coughs> Why do you think they're irritated? Yeah, to some extent, is what they mean by 8 o'clock is I, they're starting to prepare at 8 o'clock. So you need to roll in late, and that means you have put them out because you showed up at 8 o'clock, even though they said it starts at 8, you showed up at 8, and now they have to entertain you while they're preparing. So it's different, right? That's very different. Personal space is a difference. We like a lot of personal space. Um, with uh, strangers, complete strangers out in public, two feet is appropriate, that's, that's appropriate. And, and that, is, for Americans, is usually uncomfortable. Most of you have two feet of space in between the next people in the seats. So that, that, that is the norm, even uh, for complete strangers at all times, and, and no problem. They just sit right down next to you, not a problem. That's, that's how it is. It's just different. So we need to look at that in the perspective of um, I want to see this, this behavior, uh, if, it's, if it fits. If it doesn't fit, there's a reason, often a reason for it. And it's not always that just someone is, is, is weird or they don't understand. Uh, it, it might just be that that's their normal, their normal. So let's look at conformity a little bit deeper. So some of the reasons we conform. Uh, conformity, you know, changing our behaviors to fit in with other people is Im very important because we want to be accepted by other people. By our group, we want to be accepted. So it's important for us to conform. If we don't conform, there could be some penalties. We could be ostracized. We could be ridiculed. Uh, it leads a lonely life, even though for those of you who consider yourself introverted, we are social creatures. We want to have people in our life. And, and so it's important for us to conform. It's important for us to adopt the behaviors of others and to be accepted. If we don't, then we're deviating and we could be rejected. We could be ridiculed. We could be punished. There's lots of things that could happen that, that are negative for us. So conformity is important for us to conform to those norms. Even if it's being casually late, it might just be you're hanging out with a group of casually late, late arrivers, right? That might be your group. So 
Many of you who have taken psychology classes probably recall this. Uh, this was the uh, ASH study on uh, normative social influence. And, and I'll give you a little premise. So uh, there was several confederates and one participant. And they were shown these lines. And as you can see, it's kind of hard with the picture, but I can tell right away which line's the same. So here's the line, the original line. They're supposed to match that with one of the other three. Can everyone see which line it matches with? Yeah, okay. A, right? <laughs> no. So is what happened is uh, several people, the Confederates, chose the wrong line and then the participant, after hearing all these other people make the wrong choice, actually doubted their own eyesight or just said, I don't want to stand out. I don't want to make waves, basically. So they chose the wrong line too. 76% of them, two thirds, chose the wrong line. That's incredible, because that to me is so obvious. Is obvious because we want to be accepted. We don't want to stand out too much. Now, we do like to stand out in some ways, but we often don't want to kind of uh, rock the boat in, in situations. And they didn't even know each other. These weren't their group members, these are strangers. So, further research with this was. Uh, conducted by Burns, and I really, I'm sorry, I keep going in and out. Uh, so Burns uh, looked at the same study, basically replicated this, but he did this with the fMRI. So, so they took some brain imaging, and they noticed that when the participants conformed, certain areas of the brain lit up. Basically, the visual and perceptual area of the brain lit up, and it activated. That makes sense, right? You're seeing it, right? Seeing the line. Perceptual, you're kind of measuring that line. That makes sense. So the thing about this was when people didn't conform, that was what was the most alarming. When people didn't conform, so they, did, they deviated from what the other member said, they actually said the correct answer, other areas of the brain lit up, completely different areas of the brain. So you could see the amygdala lit up and the caudate nucleus, specifically the right caudate nucleus. The amygdala, for those of you, if you can remember from psychology, it plays a huge role in emotions, and in particular, negative emotions, like fear, things like that. And then the caudate nucleus uh, plays a role in modulating social behavior. So not only when we deviate from the norm, are we being possibly punished externally from other people, right? Get that look, the dirty look, right? Or, you know, the, ugh, we're not talking to you anymore, right? That punishment externally. We're getting internally punished by our own physiological mechanisms. That, that's, that's pretty moving. That's some pretty moving information. That's one of the reasons we're driven as humans to conform to our norms, to conform to our culture. It, this is how our, our whole lives work, is, is interacting between our, our brain and humans, brain and humans, brain and social, uh, to be able to conform and, and become part of the larger group. The most important thing that we can think about uh, as far as uh, thinking about culture and thinking about how culture is unique for every single one of us. Every single one of us has our own culture. Even though you know, we, many of us here are Americans, it varies, right? It varies. Not every single American uh, celebrates Christmas. Not every single American celebrates Thanksgiving in the same way. Not every single American celebrates birthdays. Right? We vary, we differ. And is what I'm hoping, uh, the one thing that I'm hoping that you'll walk away from is uh, to avoid ethnocentrism. 
And ethnocentrism is basically uh, judging another person or another group by, you know, basing it on your own culture, basing norms on your own culture. I always say using your own cultural ruler or measuring tape uh, to measure others' behaviors and others' uh, norms. Avoid that because that's when judgment comes and that's where problems uh, can, uh, can arise and, and interpersonal uh, interactions can break down. Remember, you're seeing the world with your own cultural glasses and they are too. And so I'm hoping that you walk away uh, with a little uh, more awareness uh, about the possibilities of behaviors differing and, uh, and, and it's culturally based and you may not judge, uh, hopefully. And, and we're humans and we uh, do fall into pitfalls of judgment, but awareness is the first step. Right to to not acting on the judgment, and that that's key. Uh, I did want to leave a little bit of time for questions, or comments, or anything, because oh, come on, guys, I have these. They gave me these cubes, okay, and I I forgot about them literally until like two minutes ago, and they gave me these cubes and their microphones. Yeah, <laughs> and they're soft. And so if I throw them at you, that means you can say something and speak into it and everyone will hear. Okay, so who, who has a question? I know someone has a question, has a cube. Someone. See? Okay, so I'm going to throw it out there so you guys got to be ready to catch it and then pass it back, right? Because I, I do not play baseball, trust me. So be ready. Hello? Hey, it works! <laughs> it I don't does. really have a question, I just wanted to touch it because it was soft. Oh, come on. Okay, give me an identity, one of your cultural identities. Uh, this guy right here. Oh, you identify with him. Yes. <laughs> question. How do you feel about conformity kind of affecting people hiding their own individuality? We absolutely can lose our own individuality when we conform. And, and, and it, 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 that happens. And, and it can be problematic sometimes. And we see that in, in situations where uh, uh, you're going to have to take my social psychology class for me to really get into this. But, but it, 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 where with large groups, we start losing our sense of personal responsibility and these types of things and start conforming. And that can be problematic when we lose our own identity uh, because we choose to conform. And that absolutely can happen. Yeah, great question. Who else? Somebody else want it? Yeah. See, I love these things. I'm so sorry I did that to you. What a bitch, damn. <laughs> and that was my, that's a thing. We've I heard that know. word before. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, reeling it in. Um, you had mentioned, obviously, the kind of intrinsic punishment mechanisms that go along with not conforming Woo. and going against the crowd. We're doing real well over here. Yeah. Um, okay. If you could just kind of comment on or touch on, I guess, I guess my first kind of thought out of that is that it takes a, a stronger person to not conform and to deviate and then that's what's cause for social change obviously Martin Luther King mm -hmm. all these great people they face a lot of opposition yes um, maybe you can just kind of like comment on a little bit how that varies across cultures or mm -hmm. individually it, it, it really you know we're humans and so it depends on the culture but deviating from the group that you belong to is, is going to to have some consequences uh, emotionally and, and sometimes externally from those people. So definitely large social movements and, and things like that can be difficult and that's why we see people having such difficulty standing up and being the sole person to stand up and deviate um, because often that comes with ridicule, right? Mm -hmm. It can come with ridicule and it can be punishing. So that makes it very difficult. Yeah. But the key is is persistence and, and just kind of bearing through it. And, and eventually those norms uh, start kind of 
touching. Mm -hmm. You know? And then on the other side of that, it's like the danger of the herd mentality. Mm -hmm. you know? That can be and dangerous. the negativity that can come out of that. So. That can absolutely be dangerous. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I don't want to hit it's you. It's a short toss. So um, when you were speaking about like conformity, it's kind of like a negative aspect that I was getting from it. So are there any positives to that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Conformity can be a great thing. Mm -hmm. So if you are in a parking lot mm -hmm. and you start, people are your friends and that are around you and they see trash laying on the ground, they pick it up. Next thing you know, people start conforming to that and people are picking up trash, right? That's good behavior. Right. So conformity can absolutely be a positive thing as well. It's not always negative. Okay. It's absolutely positive. Mm -hmm. Can you throw a long one? I can try. Sorry. <laughs> Yay. So you were talking about um, conformity, and she kind of like touched on it. But we were only talking about um, like actions of conformity, and that was also what was in the video was actions. So I was kind of thinking about like the mob effect. Um, and so, do emotions translate the same way? Like to conform? Can you like can you like conform with emotions? I guess is what I'm asking. Um, that's a good question. I would say that there is some. I mean, think about it if. Uh, and we're talking about like mob behavior type of thing. Uh, if you're the one person and everyone else is like vandalizing and you're like the standout person, stop, you know, don't do this. It, it could have some negative consequences, right? That they, they could turn on you as well. And, and, and that probably, I, I'm not going to lie, I would, I would have fear. So I would, I would think that the amygdala would definitely be activated. And so there's those physiological responses as well when you're in that kind of situation. Absolutely. I think it could play a role. Yeah. So um, do you think people in individualistic cultures are more likely to not conform? And then collectivistic, collectivistic cultures, they're more likely to conform or it's more looked down upon? It, it, there is higher uh, conformity in uh, collectivistic cultures. There is, is absolutely. We um, very much embrace individuality in our culture, but that's to an extent, right? Because we still belong to our own groups, even within this culture that we conform to, but we do have a, a, a lot more individualism. Absolutely. Ah, oh, way back there. Toss. I think right that way. There you go. Long arm it. There you go. Good catch. See, I knew these would be fun. Yeah. So, with like public speaking and everything, they um, they like place planted questions in the audience to like open it up and make it more free and stuff. I didn't do that. Well, no, no, no. I'm not saying you did. I'm saying like in public speaking, I learned that that's a technique that you can get people to have to answer questions and stuff. But you, do you think in like classroom settings where like people are too afraid to um, ask questions and everything because they feel like conforming uh, to not looking like the stupid ones, do you think like it would be a smart tactic for like a teacher to place like questions on the like smart kids that they know that would be okay with asking these questions mm -hmm. to be able to have the other kids ask questions as well? I think that would be a useful technique actually. I think that's a great idea. I, I, I would, yeah, I would think so. Um, I even have it in some of my classes where I'll get almost an entire class of introverts and no one wants to talk. And I'll have like one or two extroverts. And is what I end up doing is I take those extroverts and I split them up because they tend to flock together. Mm -hmm. and, and I split them up and I pair them with the introverts and they get speaking on a smaller scale in smaller groups and next thing you know it kind of comes out in, into the larger class. So, and that's a form of conformity. Absolutely. Good question. Anyone else? Anyone way back in the back so we can do a really long throw? Okay, we're gonna, it's going to be a four person pass. <laughs> okay, straight behind you. That's okay. I'm not a baseball player either. First try. Good job. <laughs> um, I just wanted to mention, like, what, what do you think about this whole phenomenon that we just happened here where, like, when you first asked for questions, nobody was raising their hand and then got the first one and now everybody is like, oh, I want 
want to use the cool soft well, box Because I brought a toy, <laughs> right? <laughs> you bring a toy and everyone wants to play, right? Yeah, I also think that it might have something to do with like the more questions that we ask, the more we get to thinking about, oh, hey, thinking about that, that actually reminds me of something else that I have a question yeah, about. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and it, it makes it a more comfortable atmosphere when more people are asking questions, right? Like right behind you. Sorry. Um, okay. As soon as I started speaking, the It just thought, went, right? Yeah. I, um, I almost did that at the beginning of the lecture, I'm not going to lie. I just had it again. <laughs> I um, almost did that myself. Do you, um, is, are politics and cultural mutually exclusive? Do you agree or disagree and why? Um, politics and culture, no. I don't think they're and mutually exclusive. Would you argue that politics are in of itself a culture? I, I think, uh, yes. And I think political affiliation is part of our culture, right? Yes. So that's a, an identity. So absolutely. And, and we even conform to group, those groups, right? Has yeah. anyone seen that happening? There's definitely tribalism. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think they're mutually exclusive at all. Not at all. Yeah. Right in front of you. Right here. I don't really have a question. I just want to say you brought up mac and cheese three times. Woo! <laughs> now it's four because someone brought it up for me. <laughs> um, oh, um, Straight back. There you go. Yeah? Sorry. We're going to lose it. <laughs> Do you believe there's a problem with ethnocentrism within our politics? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Not being able to see the other viewpoint. Absolutely. Not being able to kind of think from that other perspective and judging based upon this is your norm and, and, and judging the other uh, uh, side negatively. Yes, absolutely. Other questions? I like it. It's all the way back in the back now. Okay, so disclaimer, I'm not American. Yay! <laughs> Did I get anything right? <laughs> You're, You're like, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> um, so I, I thought it was really interesting what you said about how the different parts of the brain light up um, based on whether you conform or don't conform. Mm -hmm. But um, and I don't think this is cultural because... I think American and British culture are similar yes, in their, their need to conform. But, um, you know, for me, conforming doesn't feel good. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, have unicorn hair. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like I get it, for me, it feels pleasurable not to be like everybody else. So I wonder what that says about my chemical brain in general, like for people who actually go out of their way not to conform. Right. I mean, not that I commit crime or do anything yeah. super rebellious, you know, but just in small, yeah. non-conforming type ways. Well, there's something that your culture and my culture share. Individualism, right? So you're kind of conforming because our cultures do very much embrace this idea of having an individual uh, personality, uh, representing ourselves in a very individual way. So it, 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 it's more acceptable. So it's, it's not so much deviating, and that's probably what it is, is, is it's not s it, it quite as deviant as it would be in maybe another culture. Does that make sense? Yeah, so the brain just d wouldn't yeah. react. Yeah, it's not going to have as strong negative. of a reaction yeah. because it, that's pretty acceptable. It's fairly acceptable. A lot of my students have rainbow hair. <laughs> <laughs> when I was a teenager, I had rainbow hair. Trust me. <laughs> yeah, right that way. Uh, I got it. Hi. Hi. Um, so I'm just wondering, because you mentioned a lot about America, mm -hmm. and if you continue, when people talk about America, they literally just generalize the culture, saying okay. that America really doesn't have a culture, it's a mix, and they disclaim the food we have, the clothes we wear, the music we have, everything. Mm -hmm. So stating that, do you think America has an individual culture from the rest of the world 
and how do you f how long do you think it takes for a group of people or a country to develop their own culture to a point where people recognize it as their own and stop calling it similar or just right. making it one like this is us this is who we are this right. is our culture right I think that that's a good question. Uh, America is based on the merging of many cultures, right? So that's American, is to be able to see all the different cultures. And, and that is a term that is often thrown out a lot. Uh, how many of you have heard of the term melting pot? Yeah, I try not to use that. I don't like that. I use tossed salad. <laughs> no, I do. I use tossed salad. Because in a salad, we get to see all the different beautiful colors, right? There's the tomato, there's the lettuce, there's the, you know, all the different pieces and colors are vibrant and different and they stand out. That's America. That's America. Melting pot, it's all the same color, right? It's the same color. It's all blended together. So that is very American, the fact that we have such diverse culture, diverse ethnicities, diverse religion. Uh, so America doesn't have just one bulk culture. We have all these little pockets of culture, right? And, and that's what makes us American, and that's what makes our culture unique. Absolutely. Right behind you. We have all kinds of hands. Um, I went to school in Iowa for a year, and I had a professor that was a German woman. And we had this um, project and we had to create a floor plan for a home. And everyone made a laundry room in their home and none of us realized how that was such an American idea mm -hmm. because over in Europe, everyone, ha not everyone, but a majority of people have their like washer and dryer. Like it's just a wash machine in their kitchen. Yeah. So there's so many parts of our culture that we don't even realize Absolutely. is our culture. Absolutely. Just little things sometimes. Absolutely. Um, okay, so uh, what do you think about how culture and like individuality shapes and conformity shapes uh, like children when they're when they're growing up and how that affects later generations and how uh, things like politically and socially how they work. We change. I mean, if you look at our culture today, uh, it looks very different than it did 50 years ago, right? Uh, 50 years ago, it looked very different. So as we grow, uh, children learn new ways to conform, and, and it changes. My great-grandmother had a very different experience of American culture than I am having right now. And, and that's starts in childhood, learning and observing behaviors and seeing uh, those changes and, and conformity is part of that. Conforming to new things. Absolutely. Yeah, look at here. We have cube number two. We're going to get this to you. You're just really loud. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> in reference to childhood, um, I was trying to think of how to say this so it made sense out of my mouth. Um, I get we um, embrace individuality like as we get older and go to college and in adulthood, you know, we are about that. But in childhood, not that we are, but um, I have a very outgoing five-year-old who's just like, hey, what's up? And a majority of little kids aren't really like that. And in right. school, you know, they expect not to be robots. I mean, you have to have a really good teacher, I think, in our society to embrace individuality at such a young right. age. And I just am curious to your thoughts of how, as a society, we could do better at, you know, the term killing a spirit, like killing their spirit. Mm -hmm. What are your viewpoints on that or if we could do better as a society of that? Um, as far as their... Just as their individuality mm -hmm. into who they could become. Right. And not killing their spirit at... Because you said, like, in different societies and in our culture, 
we conform into who we are exactly. as an adult because of our starting in childhood, yeah. at, starting as an infant. So I was just curious. And I think that, how that is probably a perspective because I think many of the teachers and preschool uh, teachers not, might not think of it as killing their spirit, right? For sure. Uh, yeah. You know, so. It really is perspective. I think just starting at a really young age, uh, uh, you know, getting kids to understand uh, that they're connected to the larger world and, and starting to see uh, that perspectives different than their own is going to help with that. Uh, uh, getting some cultural awareness started very young, I think, would be helpful. Cool. Does that help answer that? Yeah, I, bit, yeah. I just and like, do you think we as a culture are good at, like, I guess I don't see the same embrace of individuality it, that we give adults right. that we take to children. There's always room for improvement, every culture, <laughs> yeah. with every culture. I think there's always room for improvement. And there's positives and negatives. Um, if you're talking about individualism and kind of, you know, um, getting them to be in this individualistic kind of mindset. Um, there's some downfalls of being an individualistic culture, but there's also some downfalls of being a collectivistic culture. So sometimes, it, I, you know, my motto in life is moderation. Yeah. <laughs> right in the middle is good sometimes, definitely. Yeah. I, I want to throw this to somebody, so, oh, okay. Right behind you, <laughs> yeah. Um, there's a macaroni and cheese festival this weekend in Scottsdale. Oh. I know. Sorry, guys. <laughs> also, you're welcome. Oh my goodness. <laughs> but I well, here. we're going to Scottsdale. <laughs> my husband's up here in front. <laughs> I do have a question. How could you use this idea of um, conformity and how your culture motivates you to motivate an individual during a time of crisis, maybe counseling or mm -hmm. an addictive behavior or something like that? How could we use it? Yeah, how could you use that? I think it is used without us even knowing. You know, it's one of the reasons why we have things like AA meetings and that because you're you're basically teaching to conform to a new group, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's being used. It just isn't obvious. It isn't an obvious. Yeah. How are we doing? Here you go. We have way over here. Where'd the other cube go? I'm trying to get this stuff. That way? Where is it? Oh, it's way up there. Wait, if I hit someone, I'm so sorry. I have to throw it? <laughs> These are dangerous cubes. We need helmets. Too late. You got it. I have a quick question. Yes. So, I do a lot of work on college campuses, and I kind of wanted to hear your input on why do you think conforming is such a big thing on like a major university with college students between like 19 and 25? Like is it more fear driven? Is it more, like what do you, what do you think? Well, we're trying to find our personal identities at that age, right? Mm -hmm. We're trying to find out who we are. So finding our group is really important at that age. Uh, and, and I think that's the key to it, is that that is when uh, conformity is probably at its key point. In addition, often most uh, the age group, uh, early 20s, uh, late teens in, in university, uh, the brain's not fully developed, their frontal cortex is not fully developed, so they might be conforming to some poor uh, decisions as far as the groups they're conforming with. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of it there. Does that help? Yeah, okay. no, I'm yeah. just curious, so. Yeah. Yeah. Where's our other cue? Oh, there we go. Let's throw it that way. Oh, good job. You're the hero. <laughs> Somebody played baseball. <laughs> so, I'm wondering what, what do you think could have a major effect on someone that made a major non-conform choice? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, left the religion or left, you know, something like that. Could, it, could they have long-term effects from that. Like maybe depression or things like that? Yeah. Some, Pos uh, absolutely. Because that's a, a, that's a identity that we really embrace and that becomes a part of our life, right? So often when you um, disconnect 
from that identity, you're not just disconnecting from something like, oh, I like macaroni and cheese, right? <laughs> <laughs> you're disconnecting from something major, and you're sometimes disconnecting from people. And, and that, that can actually cause some long-term issues, absolutely. It, it very well can. There you go. No, I lost my question. Actually. You lost it? Yeah. <laughs> How are we doing? Did I answer everyone's questions? Anyone else? Are we good? Is everyone going to have a great oh. thing? Oh, good. Sorry. I just had a question on the amygdala pictures with the conformity. Were there any positive upsides to that, like of people who... Like, I know she was referencing the um, Britain woman up there, but um, just, you know, like that we're okay with, you know, it showed it, that it was negative, but I'm wondering like either they came away from that and decided to change or like they followed up on it later or that it wasn't a, you know, like someone maybe then went and thought, wow, I did that and I didn't like that, so they changed and then... Right. Was there any... Not, not necessarily. It was more the immediate effect. And often these things are happening and we aren't even aware. We're not That's what aware. I'm wondering more. Is there any sort of where, you know, it, it does bring an awareness about or then people make a change and pause and gain an awareness of it or any sort of like... Well, what do you think you're going to do next time you're in this situation? Um, Maybe just awareness. Well, right? he, he could already tell you. Like, uh, <laughs> I actually made him come. This is his co-curricular, and I was like, this oh. is what we're going to go see. There you go. Um, because I, um, I feel like they, they both already rolled their eyes when they saw, like, we did co-sleeping until they were, yeah. you know, so for me it was like, I, they probably see <laughs> somebody turn up his face. Like, I feel like I've been on the non-conformist side of things, right. not intentionally, just because that was just like, I thought it was more beneficial to them. Right. And, you know, it just, it wasn't any act of, you know, deviation or defiance. So or you fell into that 16%, right? Yeah, which yeah. was just, you know, and to look at that, it was kind of like, yeah, you know, I didn't realize, but yeah. I wouldn't have thought like, oh, it feels like there's a negative, you right. know, sort of. Right. And it might be um, family. I mean, if, if, if it's the norm in your family, that's your group, right? And, and so it might not have, and it might not have been, there might have been more positive to counteract the negative. Well, and I wonder sense. with like those people who, you know, they were out in that group specifically speaking aloud like which you know line they were choosing right. and then I wonder like with some things where what's that show you always watch like what would you do where the people are out yeah. you know and yeah and they're on the spot watching something happen and they always wonder how many people are going to speak up and you know say mm -hmm. something and so you know if they're looking at the line and saying it publicly then I wonder how many people later would have thought like oh I don't feel good about that decision. Yeah. And then sometimes you see people kind of go back later and try and fix something they did. Or So that's why I'm kind of wondering yeah. the, if there were any sort of follow-ups or... Not in that sense, no, not in that sense. And, and actually what you're describing is a whole other psychological area. <laughs> and you're going to have to take my social psychology class in the, in the spring to, to really understand I'm gonna that. Be, I'm going to be so. back for a whole other degree. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, there you go. Yeah, it, it, I, I didn't see any specific follow-ups in that sense. Yeah, it was just immediate. I really appreciate everyone coming tonight, and I hope everyone has a wonderful Thanksgiving, and, and everybody has macaroni and cheese for Thanksgiving, okay? Thank you.